And we're live. Welcome back. This this has been a while, actually, at least for me. Um, we are back for another virtual IoT and back, I guess, also to a more um, regular schedule. Um, I think we're going to be back uh, together in, in just um, uh, two weeks time and then um, basically trying to stick to, to that schedule that we had before the vacation, which I hope uh, you guys enjoyed. Um, so today we are going to have a presentation about um, uh, even processing and complex even processing streaming. Um, you, we all know that uh, when when we generate um, and when we collect IoT data, this is just the beginning, right? You you want to make sense of all the data. So today we have um, we have Istvan and his team. We are going to um, make actually. Um, I, I had a sneak peek at uh, their demo, and it. It looks really good, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, if you guys have any uh, questions, any comments, uh, the best way to engage would be on the YouTube channel, uh, which I will also use in just a, a few seconds to to share uh, the link to the slides that we, we're going to um, have today during the, the presentation, although I think it's mostly a live demo, actually. Um, so yeah, questions on the YouTube channel. You can also en engage on Twitter using the virtual IoT hashtag. And without further ado, Istvan, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for having us today. Um, my name is Istvan Rand, and I'm here with my colleagues, Andras Jonko and Istvan Pop. We are working uh, for Inquiry Labs. Uh, and uh, you know our company is uh, doing a lot of interesting research and development also in the IoT domain. And today we are talking about uh, smarter Internet of Things with stream and event processing. So basically, it's a it's a pretty interesting topic uh, about how to make use of you know event processing frameworks for building uh, IoT systems and in particular smart home systems. So. The case study for today is going to be focused on smart home and Eclipse smart home in particular. Uh, just uh, quickly uh, to overview what I'm going to present to you today. Basically, as Benjamin has already said, this is a this presentation is very much focused on live demos. So uh, we are going to start with a little bit of slides just to give you a let's say a high level overview on the you know what what smart home is and what stream and event processing is and how these things can be connected. This is not going to be too deep. So if anyone is interested in very deep details, then I suggest to read further later. And then once this is done, we are going to show you um, an open source project that we've been developing recently, which is called the Inquiry Lab Smart Home uh, CEP Demonstrator. CEP is short for Complex Event Processing. And uh, basically, the, the theme of this uh, project is to demonstrate the usefulness of complex event processing on the edge of the smart home. Uh, primarily, this is uh, this demonstrator is meant for educational and technology so showcase purposes. And it's basically a combination of the Eclipse smart home stack uh, together uh, with OpenHab. Uh, Drools, or more specifically Drools Fusion, which is a CEP engine that powers the control logic of the, the smart home. And we also uh, will use uh, a tool called HomeIO, which is a very nice smart home simulator that allows uh, you to, to develop smart home applications without the need of actual hardware. And uh, this is, uh, like I said, an open source project. It's available and live on GitHub. So if any of you are interested, then you can just go right on GitHub and start checking out and, and trying for yourself. OK, um, so I'm going to start by an overview uh, on IoT and stream processing. Uh, this is basically a, a, the, you know, the, the, the figure or the architecture overview, which you can see in almost every slide presentation or slide deck on uh, IoT and data processing. So what are the typical components of such an architecture? Uh, well, basically. Uh, we start with you know devices, uh, sensors uh, that can actually collect a lot of data. Uh, we have these devices you know everywhere nowadays. Uh, also, not only in smart homes, but on wearables, uh, you know, smart cities, uh, smart uh, energy networks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The data which is uh, retrieved from uh, these uh, uh, smart devices is then uh, collected somehow, uh, typically using some low-level protocols, especially if we are talking about 
you know, resource-constrained devices. And uh, th um, there is always uh, something in the architecture which acts as a kind of a data publisher. Uh, in the smart home context, these are usually called gateway devices. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of nice technologies also in Eclipse, uh, in Eclipse IoT world for powering such gateways. For example, Kura is, is a very good example for this. And then um, we use uh, some um, uh, streaming uh, platform uh, for actually delivering uh, this data to where uh, it's, uh, it will then be processed and made uh, to use. Uh, there is a lot of uh, different technological options for doing this. Uh, MQTT is probably very well known uh, in the audience, but um, in the big data domain, uh, some other uh, streaming platforms are used uh, powered by cloud infrastructure, for example, such as in the case of De DeepStream Hub. Basically, the purpose of these technologies is to, to scale the data delivery um, from the collection point to uh, millions of, of uh, potential consumers. Uh, these consumers uh, usually reside on uh, cloud or enterprise application platforms and uh, you know, do useful things such as primarily storage of the data and then analyzing the data. Or in some cases, uh, which is becoming more and more prevalent nowadays, we can make use of these data in the context of real-time stream or event processing which is basically aiming at enabling uh, you know, the application to not only analyze the data, but also uh, react to it um, with a low latency or a real-time fashion. Um, and we can do this all the way down to the, to the device itself. So in a smart home, you can not only have sensors, but also actuators, you know, such as uh, switches of the lights or temperature, uh, regulators and many other things and uh, obviously the point of real-time processing is to enable such kind of functionality. Uh, if you dig into the technology a little bit deeper, um, you will find that uh, the literature is basically talking about, let's say, two different uh, approaches to, to this. Uh, a family of tools is usually called stream processors or even stream processors, and um, these are nowadays uh, very well known. So if you think of frameworks such as Apache Spark, Storm, Flink, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I think that many of you have already heard about this in some context. And there are uh, there are different tools which uh, which are called uh, event processing engines or complex event processing engines. These are a lot less well known, I think. Uh, because they are coming from, let's say, more niche domains, uh, such as uh, business process management, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, deep down, if you, if you really take a deep uh, look into the technology uh, under the hood, you will find that these are actually very similar, fundamentally. In this uh, table, I try to summarize, basically, the, let's say, the different aspects uh, across which these uh, technologies can be compared. And of course, um, you know, there are differences as well. So stream processing frameworks are usually very data centric and we use them when we are uh, interested in uh, aggregate values and, and trends. Whereas in uh, complex event processing, uh, we are focused on events and, you know, the whole point of this is to find a particular, uh, let's say, um, event pattern, uh, a succession of individual events in a stream of events, which is of interest. Uh, in, in stream processing frameworks, you find, uh, uh, let's say, uh, traditional imperative programming languages to SQL-like languages, whereas in uh, event processing frameworks, you tend to have higher level specification languages uh, based on uh, rules and patterns. Um, and there is a few things which follows from this. So basically, the whole uh, priority of stream processing frameworks is to provide speed and scalability. They are distributed by design, but um, they tend to use constrained data models and have only support for simple temporal operators. Whereas in CEP, we have a relaxed data model and uh, all these languages have advanced temporal operators, which you can use to define conditions very specifically uh, on how to relate, you know, events in time to each other, which is very important in this domain. Um, there is a lot of tools, actually, in this domain as well. Uh, some of them are 
uh, more well known, some of them are less uh, known. And this, uh, in this uh, demonstrator, we are going to use the Drool's fusion engine, uh, which is, I think, one of the more well known ones. But uh, there are also others which, uh, which are in wide use uh, in certain domains, uh, such as surveillance, predictive maintenance, smart manufacturing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, um, how does uh, this technology come together with uh, smart homes? So, first of all, a quick uh, overview on uh, smart homes. Uh, you know, a typical smart home contains smart devices uh, such as sensors and actuators. There is usually a gateway device col uh, collect connected to these, and you can use your mobile devices or web browsers to, to monitor the system and interact with the system. And in Eclipse, we have a very nice uh, technology uh, called Eclipse Smart Home, which uh, provides, a, let's say, a reusable framework for a lot of recurring challenges and aspects that need to be supported by uh, such a system, such as communication, I.O., modeling, configuration management, et cetera, et cetera. And on top of that, uh, you can have uh, concrete solutions which uh, you know, provide advanced functionality one of them is uh, called Open Hub. It's basically an automation framework. So that's that's also in the name. So the, the primary objective of this framework is to provide automation functionality on top of the foundations provided by Eclipse uh, Smart Home. If you want to know more about these technologies, then I included a couple of pointers, uh, which you can actually click in the slide. There was actually a, a, a virtual IoT meetup uh, this year about this, so you can go there and uh, watch that as well. I think it's pretty interesting. So uh, in in this demonstrator that we built, uh, we combine the, this technology with uh, complex event processing, and uh, this gives uh, this this slide that I'm showing right now gives a rough overview of how this is actually done. So. Um, uh, basically, the main components of, of the system uh, are obviously the devices themselves, which will be provided in this particular example by a simulator, which is called HomeIO. It's, it's a commercial tool, but it's, uh, it's not very expensive, and they also have a, a free uh, trial version that everyone can try, it, and you will see that it's pretty advanced, so it's, it's, uh, it's very useful. For the communication, we are going to use uh, the MQTT protocol, which is basically the standard um, in, uh, in IoT and also in very wide use, uh, also within the Eclipse world, but outside of that as well. Uh, MQTT uh, is not uh, by default supported by this simulator. So one of the contributions that is actually contained in this, this open source project is, a, is an adapter for home IO for uh, allowing it to interact with uh, other software components through the MQTT protocol. And uh, this adapter is actually tailored to, to work together with OpenHab. So, so once you have this adapter in place, then you can use OpenHab and its dashboard and other functionalities to actually observe and also control the simulated smart home environment. And on top of this, we also added some advanced control logic uh, to demonstrate how uh, you know complex event processing in general and rules fusion in particular can be useful in this uh, context. So in this system, you know, a control loop is rather uh, long and complex uh, because all the you know uh, data and all the commands will need to be, uh, let's say, propagated uh, from the devices to the to the complex event processing engine and and back. But this is obviously done automatically and uh, rather uh, quickly. OK, um, now to just to explain a little bit about the motivation behind this development. So first of all, why use a simulator? Basically, to make it a lot easier to develop smart home applications. But as you will see, the architecture itself allows naturally to for extensions to hybrid setup. So you can actually use simulated and physical components together. It makes it very easy. Uh, Rule-based programs uh, we chose basically uh, for the reasons that uh, that are well known. So uh, this approach uh, is uh, uh, allows uh, you know the, the developer to break down the the, pro uh, the problem into uh, let's say uh, easily addressable subsets, and uh, 
in many cases, uh, this kind of approach turns out to be a very simple and flexible approach, especially if you have an often changing logic, uh, which is uh, usually the case when you are doing quick prototyping. So, for example, developing, you know, uh, let's say the, the the functionality for a smart home controller. Uh, I think this is a is a rather nice uh, choice. And the uh, Drool's Fusion, in particular, uh, was chosen because the language uh, itself is much more powerful than the, you know, the simple rule-based language that the OpenHab uh, supports by default. So you can do a lot more with this language, and the technology itself uh, fits relatively well into the overall software architecture of the Eclipse smart home stack, so OSGI in particular, which will allow us to retain the benefits of the cloudless uh, architecture that the, this whole uh, world is all about. Um, it allows for a low latency offline operation, so uh, you can actually build smart homes on top of this without having to worry about security and privacy. It integrates easily with Java, so you can actually reuse your existing components and easily integrate with local and remote services. And uh, one of the most interesting application is ob obviously also naturally supported, namely to pre-filter data on the gateway uh, for edge computing purposes. So basically uh, performance or load balance uh, optimization. Uh, now, uh, just a little bit about how this uh, Eclipse Smart Home and Rules integration actually works. So Drools, you know, is a, is a rule-based engine um, that uh, has a pattern matcher and an execution agenda uh, that works on a structure that we call working memory. So this working memory is actually just a collection of uh, objects which will continuously be monitored and analyzed by the execution engine according to the rule specification that we give them. So all we need to do is provide some input and this input in this uh, case will be basically the item objects coming from Eclipse Smart Home itself. So if any of you are familiar with Eclipse Smart Home, you know that it actually represents the state of the Smart Home system using uh, a simple Java object model. And these objects uh, can directly be used for uh, driving the rule-based execution engine. And this actually saves some memory obviously, because we are operating the rules directly on the objects which are, have already been instantiated by the framework. Uh, in order to make this work, we had to extend the default event bus functionality provided by Eclipse Smart Home a little bit. Uh, in the live demo, I think you will see details of, of this, what this actually means. And on the output, like I said, we can invoke basically any kind of Java code, so it's pretty easy to actually do interactions with the concrete system via this approach. This is how a, a very small Hello World example looks like. We will get to this uh, uh, later. Now I will just tell you that basically these rules, rules are so-called event condition action specifications. Um, an event um, is always represented by an explicit object uh, in the working memory. In this particular case, we have an item state changed event. And um, the conditions can actually define, uh, you know, property value constraints, et cetera, et cetera, to define uh, explicitly the, the particular case when this rule has to execute. And when all the conditions are met, then the, the action part is invoked, which is uh, um, then uh, uh, in this particular case, you will see that at some point will call into OpenHab uh, and send some message that something should be done. The language that you see here is a, is a DSL, so it's called the Drool's uh, Rule Language, I think DRL uh, for short, and it's well documented, so if you look it up on the internet, it's pretty easy to find examples, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so far so good. So now we will uh, transition into the live demo uh, mode, and for this I would kindly ask Benjamin to switch the stream over to the computer of my colleague. Which should be done. And by the way, if there's any questions, um, please make sure to ask them on the YouTube channel or on Twitter, virtual IoT hashtag. OK, so um, what you see here right now is uh, HomeIO, the smart home simulator that I described previously. 
it kind of looks like uh, you know a computer game. So if you are familiar with you know shooters and uh, first-person shooters in particular, this is very much like that. Only here, the major uh, difference is that you are not shooting anyone, but actually roaming around the virtual house and switching on lights and activating, you know, motion detectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a pretty fascinating thing. Uh, one more technical remark. So in the in the stream, I think the the frame rate is rather low, but in reality, this runs very smooth. Uh, so so you, the viewer shouldn't be worried about this. It's it's uh, it's not very heavy on resources. Okay. So first things first, uh, we are going to start by uh, showing you how individual elements work uh, in this environment. Basically, all the Components such as light switches have three fundamental modes of operation, uh, which are called uh, wired, wireless, and external mode. And uh, so, wired and wireless mode are internal to the simulator and allows uh, you know the user of the simulator to define control logic. So, wiring, for example, a switch together with the light that it's supposed to be switching. And in the wireless mode, uh, there is a simple uh, let's say, feature uh, that you can use uh, using a tablet kind of interface to um, you know, define a, a custom logic if you want. So the wireless mode is uh, shown by the green uh, lights uh, around the, the switches. And uh, then you can bring up the tablet interface. And then this tablet interface uh, allows you to uh, you know, uh, wire things together. So for example, to connect the switch with the, the light that is supposed to be uh, switching. And then once we have the definition done, then uh, you can actually test the logic by clicking on the switch and then observing that the light has actually been switched off. So this is basically the, the built-in functionality that the simulator provides. And for our purposes, we are going to use actually the third mode, which is called the external mode. And in that mode, uh, all the control logic can be done by an external component. So HomeIO actually has an SDK uh, that allows us to to attach you know, programmatic extensions to the simulator. Uh, you, you can uh, use this SDK primarily in the C-sharp language using you know, the .NET framework. And one of the, the features that is included in this open source repository is basically um, uh, such an external connector which uh, connects uh, all the objects in the virtual world to MQTT, so all the the let's say the state information is exported as MQTT topics and, and the messages, and all the devices can be controlled via MQTT uh, commands as well. So uh, if uh, we switch everything to the external mode, which is the blue mode, then we can uh, actually make use of the, the external uh, control uh, logic. And um, to demonstrate this, uh, we are going to bring up the OpenHab uh, uh, web dashboard uh, so that you can actually see how the synchronization between uh, HomeIO and OpenHab works. So now you should have a view of the OpenHub web dashboard and the HomeIO window side by side. And uh, as we are uh, switching lights on and off, for example, in uh, the, the simulator, you can see on the right that in room E, uh, where we are standing right now, the light has been switched off. So if we click on the OpenHub uh, side as well, you can see that it works in both directions. So you can actually uh, switch uh, lights uh, via the open hub uh, controls as well. And everything works similar similarly. So if we start, for example, walking around in the virtual environment, 
you will see that the motion sensors will be triggered on the OpenHab dashboard as well. You can also observe that uh, there is some control logic already running in the background. So we've actually connected the, the lights to the motion sensor. So the user doesn't have to explicitly trigger everything. But uh, if they walk into the room, then the lights will be switched on and off automatically. And there are other things working in this virtual environment as well. So for example, we can control the window blinds uh, via switches. Yeah, there are also dimmer switches uh, in the room. So you can not only switch the lights on and off, but also control uh, them uh, more smoothly. And, uh, you know, this is a, there are a lot of useful features in this uh, simulator as well. So it shows you lots of things like power consumption and, uh, you know, temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there is a lot of potential for uh, developing a very complex smart home application. Obviously, in this demo, we are not going to use uh, all of this, but only the most uh, simple features. OK, so basically, the main theme of our demo is um, an alarm system. So this is what, uh, aside from you know just switching the lights on and off and blah, 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 the Drool's uh, uh, controller is, uh, is doing. And this alarm system is con connected to uh, the motion sensors in the in the in the building, the door sensors. So there are actually sensors attached to doors as well uh, that uh, you know trigger when you open the door. And we can also make use of brightness sensors. So the alarm system can actually uh, detect uh, if someone is, for example, walking around in your room with the torch. And uh, obviously, the whole point of this is to demonstrate how, for example, certain fault tolerance capabilities can be added to such a smart alarm. For example, uh, it can also handle situations where the intruder somehow manages to disable the motion detector. Uh, they will, their presence will still be detected uh, by the, by the, either by the doors or the, the light. So now uh, we will uh, start by actually switching on the alarm. And after uh, some time passes, the alarm is actually switched on. And if we start walking around, for example, then it will be triggered, which you see by the, the red light uh, on, the, on the speaker above the head. And uh, we can also show you, for example, that if someone disables the motion sensor, and then the alarm is, uh, you know, uh, switched on. But if you open the door, then the alarm will sound. And finally, you know, complex event processing also gives the programmer the power of using temporal operators. So you can easily define timeouts, for example, or sliding time windows for, um, you know, specifying a logic that should be sensitive to the passage of time, for example. So one of the one of the more interesting things that we developed was to connect the simulated time of the simulator, which you can see on the top of the window, actually. So right now, it's about half past 10 in the simulated world. And you can, you know, in the simulator, you can actually accelerate time. So you can make it go faster uh, quickly. And this simulated time is connected to the, to the event processing engine, meaning that you can actually test, you know, not only very short time intervals, but also long time intervals as well. 
and so we have a we have a time sensitive rule for the alarm system uh, which is connected to uh, the brightness uh, detector uh, meaning that that uh, if uh, the brightness detector detects a uh, flash of light uh, within uh, one minute at least two flashes of lights uh, signaling that someone is walking around in the room then it will trigger but if there are less uh, frequent flashes of light for example because of cars passing by on the street then it will not uh, trigger and this is what my uh, colleague is uh, demoing right now Okay, so um, this is basically the functionality that the demo uh, provides. And now we will show you a little bit under the hood how this is actually put together and how this works. So uh, one of the first things that uh, we will show is uh, how the events uh, are mapped to MQTT. So for this purpose, uh, we are going to use a tool called MQTT Spy, which I can highly recommend to anyone uh, developing with MQTT because it's uh, basically an essential tool for uh, you know observing uh, uh, messages on an MQTT event bus. And here you can see that that uh, as uh, my colleague is clicking on the switches, for example, then uh, individual uh, topics get filled with. Uh, uh, you know, messages uh, indicating state changes and commands that have been issued by the control logic, et cetera, et cetera. And we can also directly control uh, things in the virtual world via MQTT. So if you publish this message on uh, the MQTT spy side, then you will see that the light will be actually switched off uh, in the, the virtual environment. Okay, so. Uh, so far, so good. So we have already everything on MQTT. Now we will uh, show you what happens after this. And for that, we are going to uh, fire up uh, Eclipse. And uh, here, uh, you can see that basically the whole project uh, is, uh, is developed using Eclipse and can be uh, executed as a, uh, from Eclipse uh, as, a, as an OSGI uh, run configuration. And uh, obviously, one of the first uh, functionalities that we had to develop was to uh, map uh, you know, these MQTT uh, messages that are coming from the simulator uh, through OpenHab uh, into um, Mm, you know, uh, Java objects or events that can be processed by Drools. Uh, a lot of the, 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 this task is actually done by Eclipse Smart Home itself, but unfortunately the event bus that is provided by Eclipse Smart Home by default wasn't really uh, the best fit for our purpose because it just uh, propagates, uh, you know, update messages as strings and we wanted uh, to have a direct access uh, to the to the item objects, which are actually instantiated and managed by Eclipse Smart Home itself. So uh, this is basically a, a runtime model, a structure of Java objects that reflect, you know, uh, the state of the physical world, or in this case, the simula uh, simulated world. And uh, there is a so, so for observing the, these objects, we defined an extended uh, Eclipse Smart Home event bus, which uh, basically is able to uh, include uh, direct Java references to these item Java objects in the callback function. So that was basically the point of doing this. And this extended event bus mechanism works alongside the default Eclipse Smart Home event bus mechanism. So it kind of extends it and allows us to uh, actually observe the state changes of the system uh, by just looking at the state changes of these Java objects directly. 
Um, so this is basically an extension of the Eclipse Smart Home Event Bus, and you know you can attach client clients uh, to this uh, event bus uh, like you can with the original one. And obviously we created a client specific to the Drool's uh, complex event processing engine, uh, whose main task is to to process these uh, item state changes. Let's put it this way, and um, feed them into the into the Drool's uh, processing engine so that they can actually, you know, drive the execution of the rules specifications. Now, uh, just uh, to have give you a quick overview of the code, uh, basically there is two main functionalities that are covered here. One of them is uh, has to do with the propagation of the simulated time. This is uh, uh, shown towards the the where the highlight is right now, and the other part is uh, concerning you know the processing of these updates. Uh, first of all, if there is any property value update to an already existing object, or um, if uh, if there is a this this code also supports uh, dynamic configuration changes as well. So if for example new items are added to the Eclipse Smart Home. Uh, on the fly, then the, the Drews engine also uh, can uh, cover this case as well. And whenever there is a change to an item, uh, then we create a special uh, representation object called an item state change event, which will be then used to, to activate all the rules which uh, are sensitive to this. And once the, the, the rules have finished uh, processing, uh, then we convert uh, this uh, into an item state history, which will be residing in the working memory of the engine so that you can also include this in uh, rules if you wish. So for example, if you want to define a kind of a logic which uh, also takes into consideration changes that have occurred at some point in the past, then you can do this by referring to item state history objects. Okay, so this is basically the, the Java glue code that integrates rules with the system. And now we will show you how the individual rules look like. Uh, first one is, um, like I said, uh, so these rules are written in a, in a DSL called uh, the DRL, DRL files. And um, uh, here, uh, the first example is the one that is from my slide. So this is just a very simple logic that uh, connects a light switch together uh, with its uh, particular uh, light item that should be triggered uh, by that. And obviously the key to actually doing the changes is this openhab.post command, which is basically a call to a Java utility class that we, we provide for, uh, for uh, you know, convenience purposes. You can also do more complex things with this language, obviously. For example, a dimmer switch. Uh, which uh, can also, uh, you know, incorporate logic where uh, one particular light can be controlled by more than one uh, switch. In this, in this particular case, three such switches. And in this uh, rule, we again use an auxiliary helper class called the time dimmer, which uh, will feature its own uh, time control loop in order to create the dimming up and dimming down effects. And finally, uh, you know, there are the rules of the alarm system, uh, which uh, uh, start by actually uh, using an advanced uh, language feature from Duels, which is called uh, an implicit uh, event, which is derived uh, from uh, lower level changes. And this uh, these implicit events are used to control, you know, the basically the state machine. Uh, kind of control flow in the in the control system uh, to facilitate uh, you know features such as uh, you know the alarm system shouldn't trigger uh, when it's already armed etc cetera, etc cetera. in this code we also have temporal operators a little bit further down so for example uh, that this after uh, is is a temporal operator from Drew's fusion uh, which uh, you know makes uh, the alarm 
arming actually have a tolerance of a 10 seconds. So once you have the alarm armed on the keypad, you have 10 seconds to exi exit the, the house via the door and the alarm uh, will not arm. And then a little bit further down, we have the, the time window for the brightness-based intrusion detection, which uh, enables the rule you know, to consider uh, the changes of uh, lightning level within uh, a, a time window from five seconds to one minute. So this is the kind of you know, temporal operator and complex event processing logic uh, that makes it easy to incorporate, uh, you know, such uh, such features into a smart home control uh, in a rather straightforward and also easy to change and customize way. Uh, one of the things that we also developed as part of this open source feature is a way of actually testing these rules without having to run the simulator itself, because obviously even though working with the simulator is very nice, uh, it sometimes it's, uh, it can also be a little too slow and uh, you know, requires human uh, interactions. So developed, uh, let's say, a mini mock framework uh, that allows us to test the rules without actually having to run the simulation itself uh, you know, via you know, standard JUnit uh, constructs. And uh, these, uh, these uh, test configurations can be invoked from Eclipse in a, you know, the way it's usually done, so uh, without any uh, special thing. And the logic of these tests you know, is uh, very simple. So basically, you uh, initialize uh, the model uh, first, uh, so add the, some uh, items into the uh, configuration. And then you do some state changes within the test. And then you do some assertions on whether you know, this, the things that are supposed to happen actually happen. So for example, if we trigger an example switch, then uh, you know, the example light should be switched on, for example. So that's the first two lines of the test, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. OK, so this concludes uh, you know, the live demo. And uh, maybe. Uh, there are already some questions at this stage. If not, then I can just uh, go on to the, the final summary slide. Are there any questions? Uh, there's actually um, some, some questions uh, regarding like a general question on what's um, a good, uh, if you have a recommendations on, on hardware to use for home automation. Uh, but I guess my answer to that to that is that there's really a lot. If you look at Open Hub, it supports something like 200 different brands of uh, home automation gadgets. Um, but I guess another question is, um, have you guys tried uh, to do more than just um, simulation and, and hook up the system to, to real sensors? OK, so let, let me actually split that question into two, because I think Part of it is is very relevant. So, so uh, you know, uh, rules is coming from the enterprise world. It's it was originally envisioned as a something that you would run on a large server, and obviously we are running this now on a smart home gateway, which is a lot you know less resources typically. But the thing is that nowadays even the smart home gateways are so powerful that they can run Java rather well. So obviously. Eclipse Smart Home and OpenHab itself are based on Java. And uh, you know, the, usually, even in the Raspberry Pi nowadays, you have, let's say, two gigs of RAM. So, so even a more complex, uh, uh, let's say, rule-based system can be run uh, efficiently uh, on a Raspberry. So, so you can you know, experiment with this without you know, having to buy very expensive devices. That, that's the first part of the question. And second part of the question, whether we actually tried on real, using real devices, yes. So we didn't include this in the demo, but we actually have a, a hybrid setup as well, where uh, you know, the simulated environment is combined with uh, real world uh, you know, proximity sensors and switches and things like this. And like I said in the, in the preamble, it's, uh, you know, the architecture makes it rather easy to, to work like this. Because you know, in, in Eclipse Smart Home and OpenHab, 
you can easily connect your physical devices um, to the system and, and then have the rules actually process changes not only coming from the simulator but also from the real physical devices itself simultaneously. Cool. Um, I don't see other questions um, as of now, so maybe you can sort of wrap things up and, and people watching, this is now your last chance to, to basically um, send us your, your questions so that we can yeah. we can spend some more minutes answering them. Okay, so if you can give me the presenter view back. There you go. So in summary, um, we went through, uh, let's say, all the major features of this open source project. Uh, obviously, the first one is uh, is the Home IO MQTT adapter, which basically is a standalone component. So you can use it or make use of it without uh, having to use any of the rest. It's, it's actually a standalone command line application written in C Sharp. Um, and then we have this extended event bus for Eclipse Smart Home that allows us to actually uh, listen to changes of this uh, runtime model inside Eclipse Smart Home. We also developed uh, the integration of tools into this OSGI environment. Uh, some of you actually might know that uh, in the OpenHab 1.x times, uh, there already has been something like this, but it was largely abandoned as far as we could tell. So we basically redeveloped this uh, this OpenHab rules integration from scratch, but in a more generic way. And this code is also contained in this repository. Uh, we also have the case study itself separated. So all the, the code is structured and modular. Uh, so the case study is separated from the generic components and it's all documented on the wiki. So if you are interested in uh, setting this up and playing with it yourself, then you can just follow the documentation on the wiki. And aside uh, from this, uh, we also uh, developed this very small mock framework for, uh, you know, helping uh, the development of the rules via JMIT tests. The whole thing is uh, built with Maven and Tyco, so it should be pretty easy to just to check out and try yourself and deploy it yourself. Uh, as for the plans for the future, uh, one of the things that we are working on right now is uh, to also enable uh, working with uh, other simulators. There are open source simulators out there, so not just this commercial tool, but for example, OpenSHS is, a, is an open source smart home simulator. And obviously, we are also interested in uh, you know, trying other event processing engines. Uh, to compare it in terms of, let's say, usability or uh, performance with, with rules. Uh, one of the most interesting things that we would like to do is to, to work on a little bit of the, on the developer tools that you can use nowadays for developing with Eclipse Smart Home and OpenHab in particular, because one of the things that we found while working on this project was that it's not, you know, um, so nice sometimes uh, to to integrate uh, these technologies together and actually make a working system. So uh, we will actually uh, uh, do a little bit of work on the integration of the Drools debugger uh, so that you can actually uh, use Eclipse not only for authoring the tools but also for debugging them like you would debug a Java program. And uh, you know, since there is a lot of uh, repetitive uh, code uh, and configuration involved, we are also going to do some, you know, IDE features that uh, will, you know, do some auto generation things so that it's easier to to get started with uh, the development of uh, something like this. In the long run, uh, we would be very open to contribute this to you know Eclipse projects if there is interest from their side. So I hope there is. Um, and obviously, uh, the whole uh, project is open source, so if anyone is finds finds this interesting and would like to, uh, you know, contribute and help us with ideas or enhancements, then they are very welcome to do so. So that's why it's all open source and APL licensed. And finally, well, there's, there's actually a, a couple of questions that I think um, you can easily answer. Um, uh, Alex is asking from some sample code, and Martin is uh, is wondering. 
what wiki you are referring to. So maybe you can quickly switch to and show the GitHub repository where both, um, I guess, code um, and the wiki can be found. And so that people can, can see. E, yep. So the GitHub repo is uh, here. I hope that you can uh, see uh, my screen still. Yes. Uh, the, the link to it is actually also in the slides, so so uh, you don't need to you know <laughs> quickly jot down this, yeah. but you just click on it, and so everything is uh, everything is here, all the code that we've been showing. It's it's currently on a on an issue branch, but it will be um, shortly merged in the master, and uh, you can click on the wiki here, uh, and then uh, on the developer guide, for example, to uh, you know get started. Uh, with uh, making things work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We will extend this, so it's uh, it's rather, let's say, rudimentary or, or more like a draft uh, at its current stage. But but uh, we are going to uh, improve this uh, so that it's easier for interested people to, you know, actually try this themselves and get started. And if you know you want to actually contribute, there is already a lot of open issues uh, here uh, on the, the GitHub repo, so you can actually. Uh, comment there or create your own issue or start discussing with us. You are very welcome to do this. Uh, obviously, we would like to work on this uh, much more in the in the future. Cool. Um, so I okay, think so the final thing that I wanted to say today is uh, uh, just a, a, a plug <laughs> for our uh, presentation at EclipseCon Europe. You know, there is going to be an IoT day. And it's going to be very interesting and very exciting IoT day. And uh, we've been uh, lucky enough to be selected as one of the lightning talks. Uh, I think it's towards the, the second uh, part of the day. And I'm going to present this there shortly as well. And also, if anyone is interested, then I would be very glad to, to meet there and talk. Um, I don't really hear you anymore, Benjamin. So in terms of shortening that. Uh, can you hear us, Benjamin? Hmm. 